Ladies and gentlemen, this Red Gaming Tentacom video, we're going to be analyzing the Xbox One and PlayStation 4's GPUs. Now, the graphics systems on both machines have undergone a numerous changes since their initial reveals as the Durango and PlayStation 4 leaks way back when. For example, just a couple of days ago, or yesterday even, we heard news that the Xbox One GPU has been over, well, increased in clock speed from 800 MHz to 853, as well as numerous driver improvements as well. Same thing goes for the PlayStation, and of course now we're learning a lot more about asynchronous computing that it can do, we're learning a lot more about the various changes that Sony have made to its GPU to much better facilitate compute along with graphics performance. And so all of that together means that it's actually a lot easier to create at least a semi-educated guess. Now, most likely this is going to be a couple of part videos because I don't want to get too far off the point on this one. So, one really tempting thing that people do, and this is I've noticed this a lot, particularly on various forums and comments and uh, people messaging me and stuff like that on Facebook. Uh, that's facebook.com slash redgamingtech slash plug. Um, one of the things is that they say, okay, well, what are two PC GPUs that are really close to it? I mean, you know, can we get an idea of the performance there? Because let's say... Well, before the clock speed increase, it was 50%. So let's just go with that, so it's a nice round number. It's 50% more graphics, so does that mean it's going to be 50% more frame rate or something? You know, how how is it all going to work? And it's actually quite interesting, because when you start going down that route, it's actually not really the best way to go, as it turns out. For example, pure example... Let's discuss the AMD Radeon HD 7790. Now, this graphics card, in terms of the amount of compute units that it actually carries, 14, which gives it a grand total of uh, 896 stream processors, you might think to yourself, that's actually a pretty good analog, you know, that's a pretty good bench for the Xbox One. But then cast your eyes, good sir, on the engine clock, the actual GPU clock speed. It's 1,000 megahertz. Now, that's about 150. I'm not going to split hairs over the 3 megahertz. That's about 150 megahertz over, over the top. You'll also notice that in addition to that, that means you've got about, actually just a smidgen, a hair under, 1.79 teflops, which is almost exactly the same amount of power as it turns out, as the PS4. So that's that's quite a disparity, as I'm sure you're aware. So let's give another example. Let's use the 7850. Now, I've heard some people using this as the PS4 GPU, and there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, it actually has a couple of extra uh, compute units. It actually has two lists in the PlayStation 4. It has 16 versus... Um, 18, 18 being on the PS4, of course. This means that you've got 1,024 stream processors. Just for FYI and as a comparison's sake, the PS4 actually has 1,152, I'll repeat that number one more time, 1,152 stream processors. So one of the things you're going to immediately notice is that it actually has one point. 76 teflops of computing power which is a little bit under where it should be you'll also notice that its engine clock is running at 860 megahertz as well so that's not the best analogy either however if you were to go to the graphics card slightly ahead of this which as it turns out is the radeon 7870 i'll repeat that one more time 7870 um you're actually looking at 2.56 teflops of computing power. Why? Well, it's got 20 compute units. That's 1,280 stream processors running at 1,000 megahertz. And so you can see right there that there's no actual 
PC-like GPU that goes into the PlayStation. There's also a significant difference in architecture as well, and we're going to break this down in this video, maybe another one as well, depending on the length of this one. And we're going to really talk about this um, very, in it, well, quite quite in depth actually, as it turns out. So what's going on here? Well, for starters, there are numerous issues with saying that Xbox One GPU and the PlayStation GPU and doing a like for like comparison. It's actually not just a case of looking at the raw performance numbers because sometimes actually having a higher clock speed versus having more compute units can somewhat give you an advantage in certain tasks. Similarly, there are other issues as well, such as memory. Um, how the memory is split up in the console, the speed of the memory, um, memory latency as well, the API, the application programming interface, the operating system that's controlling it, um, what other modifications have been made to the actual GPU itself. Um, to put it mildly, there are so many different things that just make this... Um, very difficult to just say, okay, well, you can get these two graphics cards from these two desktops and do a benchmark. For a start, there's another issue as well, and that's the APU design. Now, I'm not really, even if you dismiss the compute functionality, which I think is fair to do, and I think it's probably better to do uh, as a, if you were to do this, then you don't really have to worry about PCIe bandwidth on graphics cards of this caliber. Uh, PCIe 2, let alone 3, which has significantly higher bandwidth, it's going to be absolutely fine with this. It's not going to have an issue because, I mean, you can put a Titan in there and a, a Titan is significantly more powerful than these cards. Um, you know, you're looking at like 4 or 5 T-flops for the really high-end PC cards. So, you know, 2 point, you know, 2 point odd who cares, you know, the PCIe 2 is going to easily be able to handle that. But it actually turns out that there's a number of other issues as well. One issue immediately that pops up is the ROPs. Now, ROPs are pretty damn important. We'll go into what they are in just a moment. But the PS4 has 32, and the Xbox One has 16, so quite literally half the amount. Now, a ROP, uh, there's actually a couple of... Uh, anagrams for it. The first is render output unit, but it's better known, or perhaps properly known, whatever you want to say, as a raster operations pipeline. Now, a ROP, the raster operation, is actually, it doesn't really happen, it doesn't really need to do anything until near the end of the rendering process. However, what it does is it does help to apply anti-aliasing, uh, anisotropic filtering, it helps calculate depth. Uh, calculating depth, by the way, is also known as the Z-buffer. Now, a ROP, in conjunction with the core clock, so in other words, the actual clock speed of the GPU, this helps to create, or shall I say, it's one of the defining factors of what is known as the pixel fill rate. So, it's very important here, just so you guys are aware, that it's not a direct correlation. It is not like saying, well, okay, you've got half the amount of ROPs, and so what? 50% of the performance? No, it's not. Um, there are uh, numerous other issues. However, it does generally impact things such as anti-aliasing, filters, um, certain lighting effects, and a lot more other stuff as well. However, there are issues in place for the lack of ROPs. One of those is memory bandwidth slash amount of memory. This is a very important key point because if you don't have the bandwidth or the actual processing power anyway to handle it, the ROPs what what's what's the good of them? They're just simply, you know, pointless. It's almost like having, you know, ten people trying to put let's say you're working on a conveyor belt system idea, and let's say you've got ten people to put items into the box uh, down one end of the conveyor belt, and you've got the very opposite end of the conveyor belt, you've got two people putting items on the conveyor belt. So in short, ten to two, it's not 
sorry, 10 versus 2, or should I say 2 to 10 in this case, it's not really going to work, is it? Because you're still massively outnumbered. So in regards to 16 ROPs, however, it is usually more than enough for 1080p or 1920 by well, 1080, which is what the Xbox One and PlayStation 4 are shooting for. So many people are asking, well, why are these extra ROPs on the PS4? At the moment, it's a bit of a mystery. If I had to guess, it would probably be so that Sony know that they've got some levels of free anti-aliasing, uh, that they could apply various filters, and it just doesn't hurt to have. But the Xbox One isn't certainly going to be, you know, 50% of GPU performance because of this. Furthermore, it's actually... Um, pretty well known that more compute units on certain games don't really, I mean it depends heavily on the engine, for example the Unreal Engine may handle things differently from the, the id engines or for example Metro Last Light Engine compared to say a different game and so on and so on and so on because there's so many different game engines out there and it really depends on how they've been programmed but we'll go into more about that in just a moment. Um, but more GCN cores don't necessarily mean that you're going to get a one-to-one -one improvement on performance. It's not necessarily true that if you have, say, uh, 18 GCN cores compared to 12 GCN cores, and let's assume that everything else was exactly the same in this you know, magical fantasy land of the pixels, you know, exactly the same amount of memory, exactly the same type of memory, exactly the same ROPs, exactly the same everything, including the clock speeds. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get a 50% increase in performance. It just doesn't really work like that in reality. In fact, just to give you an illustration of how things don't really scale to a, you know, a one-to-one -one ratio, you could even start overclocking uh, graphics cards, you can see the difference. Uh, a really stupid example, a really simple example, but certainly one that does hold a little bit of water, is that certain cards, for example, they may be bandwidth constricted. So, in other words, you can overclock the GPU. Let's assume that you have a GPU clock speed. Let's just make it nice, easy numbers to work with here. Let's go, you've got 500 megahertz a GPU clock speed and 1000 megahertz memory. Uh, really easy numbers to work with. And let's assume that you were to overclock that GPU to 550 megahertz, right? You would think that that would be a pretty decent sizable chunky performance, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get like 5, 10%. In other words, whatever, you, you know, a one to one ratio in clock speed. So if you put it up, say, 10%, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get 10% extra performance. Why? Well, there's numerous issues right there and then. And this is on exactly the same graphics card, by the way, on exactly the same PC. All you've done is change one clock, but it's not a linear difference. Why? Multiple reasons. One, it could be a driver suck. But let's assume that that's not the case. Let's assume that all of that's the same, then why wouldn't it scale? Well, it's a couple of things. It could be that you don't have enough memory on the graphics card. It could literally be that the texture, the graphics card still needing to keep swapping between um, the memory that's on the graphics card, the local graphics card. Say, for example, you've got a gig of graphics card memory. Then it may say, okay, well, at 1080p, I can't fit everything I need right in here so sometimes I have to access the system memory so it's thrashing the local buses in this case PCIe. Another example and probably more likely in many cases is bandwidth. Generally speaking graphics cards are made for a one to one ratio however there have been um, times when they've not. Certain graphics cards have been notoriously constrained bandwidth. I've used the example of the GeForce 1, the GTS, and also the GeForce 2. They've both been very bandwidth constrained and they actually needed to do some improvements in NVIDIA. And this is also the case, by the way, of various AMD or back then ATI as well cards. And certainly they're not getting off scotch-free. And how it basically worked is that, yeah, you can overclock that GPU, feel free, my friend. You're not going to get much of a performance. And indeed, you could feel free to Google some various websites on this. I'm not going to bother to, you know, do it for you because it's just extra video length. But, you know, sometimes you get 1%, 2% 
on say a 10% overclock. On the other hand, you could slightly increase the CP the memory clock speed and you would see a significant jump in performance in terms of frame rate. And simply because it was bandwidth constrained all along, so you could actually have the GPU clock speed exactly stock, overclock the memory and get a much bigger increase. Um, and that's just how things sometimes work. Next, let's talk about the memory type. Now, the memory on the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One has become very linked into quite a lot of arguments. Um, and one would think that it's a simple case of, well, all memory is used for is just throwing data into it and that's it. Unfortunately, anyone who knows about PCs or computing and stuff, they know that that's absolutely not the case. One of the reasons that Mark Cerny has been so adamant, so so bullish, if you will, about actually advertising the PlayStation 4's UMA, Unified Memory Architecture, is because, well, it's very fast. It uses GDDR5 memory. That gives you 176 gigabytes per second. Now, we do know that the AMD Jaguar, the CPU section of it, so the CPUs, there's eight, uh, eight cores, so eight threads, they have access to about... 20 gigabytes per second and the reason I emphasize the word about is that isn't 100% confirmed uh, it could be a little bit more it could be a little bit less but we think it's about 20 so what does that mean well we do know that the Xbox oh, sorry I'm sorry the PlayStation 4 actually has a very unique uh, bus structure and they basically worked with AMD to add in an extra bus um, so Effectively speaking, the GPU could speak to the memory, the memory can speak to the CPU, the CPU can speak to the GPU, and all of this can go on simultaneously, and this is really important. Um, and those two, by the way, those two uh, buses are known as onion and garlic, and you guys can check out a memory video that I've done on this already, uh, if you so wish and so desire. But the Xbox One, we're not going to talk about its uh, bus structure just for a moment. Instead, we're going to talk about the, the way the memory is actually allocated and created. So there's two types of memory. Now, I know this might sound like we're getting slightly off the track because this is more of a GPU video, right? Unfortunately, this is a case of, well, it matters. Because remember how I was just giving you guys the example of the GeForce 2, or whatever I was using, um, and how it was memory constrained? Well, yeah, exactly. So, the Xbox One doesn't have crap memory. Um, this has been a bit of a, a thing. Now, Mark Cerny and a couple of others have really quickly said, well, this GD GDDR5 memory isn't that latency heavy. We'll go into that in probably a different video because it's a really complicated subject to go into that stuff. But others have said, well, you know what, DDR3 is, well, not. And we know that, so the ESRAM on the Xbox One combined with the DDR3 memory on the Xbox One is what helps to give pretty much a comparable amount of memory bandwidth to the PlayStation 4. It's a little bit of a difficult thing to know the exact amount of memory bandwidth. Right, right now, the embedded memory bandwidth of the ESRAM is thought to be 102 gigabytes per second. However, Microsoft themselves have said that they've managed to do various, claim, uh, various improvements on the final yields, which means that it's about 192 gigabytes per second. However, there is a lot of debate of whether this is actually 100% true. I'm not going to go into it in this particular video. I'm going to clarify that in another video. Um, so that works in conjunction with DDR3 memory, which is running at 68.3 gigabytes per second. And just like the PS4, this is on a 256-bit uh, system memory bus. So first thing you're going to notice is that 
it's going to be very interesting how developers use this because it's a very small amount of memory. Um, I've used the example of the textures of the of PS4's Killzone before, but it basically is going to have to be very small, often used instructions that are filled, or should I say, placed into this memory. Now, most likely it will have a good hit rate. Hit rate, just so you guys are aware, means that it'll often have the data in it that's required. Um, however, still, the problem is there's not much room for growth in terms of developers and what they actually need. So it's a kind of a complicated thing. We're not exactly sure how well this is all going to fit together. The other issue, and this is a really big one, is let's say we know from what developers have said that the common ground on these systems is typically a PC. And we'll go into that more later. Um, and therefore they develop with the PC in mind and then they spread the, their wings, if you will, of the code and then they place it onto the Xbox or the PlayStation or whatever formats they need to do so on. And the reason they do this is, well, quite simply because it shares common ground in terms of the APIs. It turns out the PS4 uses very similar APIs to DirectX and DirectX is, well, on the Xbox One, so you can see how that works. But the problem is, let's say that they managed to get it working on PC. Now, PCs you can't compare with the memory architecture because they've just got so gosh damn much. Um, graphics cards on PCs have at least one gig local, sometimes two, or even three or four, whatever the graphics card is, depends heavily, of course. And therefore, you don't really need to worry. Say, two years down the line, the GPU of a PC isn't going to have less than two gigs as the minimum. Most likely, it's going to be three or four as a standard. Um, and this is especially true when you start talking about 1080p. Uh, but even so, 2 gigs, 1080p, more than enough. My point being, however, that this has been designed, um, the PS4 rather was designed in mind of, you know what we want? We want to give people a lot of memory and we want them to be able to access that memory for graphics technology really, 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 really easily. And the purpose behind that is quite simple. So that developers could shunt the memory around it, put textures or whatever they need in. Now the reason I bring all of this up in this video, even though this is a graphics focused video, is this is just another point of how it's not really easy to say, well, okay, the PS4 has 50% more GPU capabilities because it also depends heavily on just how he on how well the ESRAM of the Xbox One is managed. Um, I personally am fairly optimistic about it. I think it's not going to be a travesty or anything like that. The reason, of course, that they did go with this, and regular viewers do know this anyway, so I've mentioned it a couple of times, but basically the reason they went with this is because they didn't really think that GDDR5 was going to be uh, prevalent. In terms of sufficient quantities and so Microsoft basically took a gamble that's what the rumors are anyway and so they said you know what what we're gonna do is we're gonna fill up the GCN uh, sorry we're gonna fill up the Jaguar with these move engines in the ESRAM that's why it's all part of the same die and that's conversely why they've got less uh, less GCN cores in there because obviously they, you just can't have this you know rapidly growing die that's what the size of the console that just doesn't work in practical terms However, there is another point to make, because it does have less GPU cores in it. In theory, it shouldn't need so much memory bandwidth anyway. It's also not focused so heavily on compute. Now, there is a hell of a lot more to this, and we could go into it for quite a while. Suffice to say, however, that those things alone make the comparison very tricky. So we've still got a hell of a lot to talk about, um, and this video is already turning pretty lengthy. So what I'm going to do on this video is I'm going to do something a little bit different from normal. I'm actually going to call the video here. Now, regular viewers will know that normally my videos are like 50 minutes for tech. However, I've had a couple of messages on Facebook, and they've actually started to suggest that I cut them into 20 to 25 minute or even 30 minute parts. 
uh, because they said it's more manageable. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to follow that advice for the next couple of videos. So what I want you guys to do, if you don't like that, if you prefer the videos to be lengthier, I want you to message me on Facebook and tell me. So go to facebook.com slash redgamingtech and you can either leave a message on the wall or you can message, you know, leave a message, um, you know, the conventional way. And actually tell me, don't put it on the comments, please. Just use the comments to talk about other stuff because I don't generally read the comments. That's just me personally. So there is a lot more we need to talk about. But for the purposes of this, I'm going to split it into two videos because I've been requested to do so by a couple of viewers. If you don't like that, if the majority of you don't like that, I will revert back to the other format. So, uh, yeah, just let me know and we'll go from there. So anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed this video. So come back to, it, to me in the second part where we can continue.